as they will go for the three-game sweep of the White Sox. It's the White Sox and the Athletics coming up right here on Comcast Sportsnet California. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Oakland A's Baseball, along with Ray Fossey. I'm Glenn Kuyper. Well, we figure the A's have to sweep the homestand. Well, they're off to a good start. They won the first two games of this series. And today, Brad Anderson will take them on. And Ray, he's won his last three starts. He's given up just four runs in those three starts, so he's finishing strong. You know, the key for him is that breaking ball to the back foot of the right-handed hitters. The White Sox got to see a Gio Gonzalez in the first game of the series. They're going to see a similar pitcher this afternoon. Look at that hard breaking ball. So tough on the right-handers. And, of course, Brad Brad Anderson knows that when he needs a go-to pitch, it is the slider. And how about filling his position? Three in that game, but does a great job. And I think for him, he just wants to finish strong. He has two more starts after today. What a great way to finish for him. He'll be opposed by hard-throwing Edwin Jackson. Interesting year for Jackson. He's thrown a no-hitter. That's great, but it was with a different team. He's been traded since the no-hitter. And he also threw a lot of pitches. How about 149 pitches? 100, they start thinking about getting the guy out of the lineup. But this young man can throw hard we saw in Detroit before he went to the Diamondbacks, but he does have a no-hitter against the Tampa Bay Rays. Nothing's going to be taken away from that game, but uh, there's no doubt 149 pitches. A lot of people talking about that, but he still throws very hard. And he's pitched very well yeah. against the Athletics in his short career. So that is your matchup, Edwin Jackson and Brett Anderson as the A's go for the sweep of the White Sox to try to stay alive in the AL West. A's, White Sox, will have lineups when we come back. AT&T. Find out what's possible with the nation's fastest mobile broadband network. AT&T. Rethink possible. And by Corona. Relax and refresh with Corona and Lime. Beautiful day at the ballpark. The A's have just taken the field behind their starting pitcher, Brett Anderson. And, of course, Kurt Suzuki behind the plate. And today the A's will go for the sweep. Trying to stay in the Rangers' view. Rangers, they will play tonight. Game time weather brought to you by the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. The admission is free. The boardwalk is open this weekend. Beautiful. 68 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. So day baseball, midweek baseball, 
from the Coliseum. So the White Sox struggling big time closing out the season. They have lost eight in a row. They have lost 12 out of their last 14. And this is the lineup they will send against Brett Anderson. Juan Pierre in left. Alexi Ramirez at short. Alex Rios in center. Paul Canoco at first. And it's Manny Ramirez, Carlos Quinton, young catcher Tyler Flowers, Brett Morrell at third, and Brett Willibridge at second. Here's the A's starting defense. It's brought to you by Black Diamond Brewing Company, Carter Davis Gross in the outfield, Iwamura, Pennington, Sogard, and Larish on the infield. Kurt Suzuki is the catcher, and Brett Anderson is the pitcher. And Brett Anderson coming off a very good start against the Twins. The last four starts, he's 3-1. and one. As a matter of fact, he's won his last three. To even his record is 6-6. Six and six. So quite an accomplishment for him. And got mentioned earlier, 92 in a third inning. So with three starts remaining counting today, He'll get well over the 100 pitch mark or 100 innings and be ready for the 2011 season. But today, first and foremost, try to sweep the White Sox. And it starts with the pitch. Corner infielders in for Juan Pierre, and it's 2 0. So the White Sox, 79 and 72. Just mentioned their struggles. The A's, on the other hand, 76 74. Is their record? They won four out of five. So right now, so we all know, the A's are seven out with 12 to play, and that includes today's game. So seven out with 12 to play, and the Texas Rangers will play tonight in Anaheim. And the Angels will be trying to sweep the Rangers. So that is the setup in the AL East for the final, or AL West, sorry, for the final week and a half. And we hope for all the early arrivals at uh, Angel Stadium in Anaheim. They're enjoying today's game as they prepare for tonight's game, whether it's the Angels or the Rangers. And we'll look forward to seeing the Rangers tomorrow night, the first of the four game series, the final four of this homestand and regular season. The pitching matchup for that game tonight down in Anaheim will be C.J. Wilson for Texas. He's 14 and 7. Dan Heron is going to pitch for the Angels. The Angels playing better. They've won 9 out of 12. So. They are doing their best to keep it interesting. A little bouncer, Anderson off the mound, bare hands, wow. falls down, and still gets Juan Pierre. Let's hope he's okay. He did see him look up and then say a few words. Let's hope he didn't hurt himself. But Revere of the Minnesota Twins, he handled three balls that he hit. And what you know it, the speedy Juan Pierre, watch this play. Falls down, bare hand flips. To Jeff Larish and gets Pierre by plenty. What a great play defensively. Evergood Ultramo brought to you by or uh, Ultramo brought to you by the Evergood Sausage Company. And this is great in Ultramo to see Brett Anderson feeling his position perfectly again this afternoon. So one out for Alexi Ramirez. Got to keep off the bases too. And one Pierre stolen base threat leading the league. Takes care of that. Ramirez is retired. Check out our keys. The game brought to you by Toyota. Of course, the perfect home stand continues. The A's are 2 0 against the White Sox in the final seven home games. Athletics are not going quietly. They are putting together a mash unit in a sense and playing well. And for Brett Anderson, finished strong. And what better way to start than today against the White Sox? And predominantly a right handed hitting lineup, which can work. In favor of Brett Anderson, especially with a hard slider curveball down and in. First pitch strike to Alex Rios. Second pitch, breaking ball, first strike, and it's 0 2. For Kurt Suzuki catching the third game of this series, and Joe Gonzalez, a right or lefty on Monday, and Trevor Cahill, righty last night. And he gets another lefty this afternoon. So, in a sense, he has an idea, especially with Gio and Brett Anderson, similar in their pitching, and how to call the game this afternoon. Trevor last night was tremendous. Gio also six shutout innings on Monday night. Rios bounces it foul, so the count. Stays at two and two. So three nothing. The A's won it on Monday, seven to two. 
last night. So pitching has been great as Ray said just two runs allowed to the White Sox in the first two games of the series. This is bounced to third. You Mara has it and that will do it. So Brett Anderson a three up three down inning. Three ground ball outs. We head to the bottom of the first. Up with Rajay Davis in the leadoff spot, then it's Pennington, Suzuki, Cusk, Gross, Iwamira, Carter, Larish, and Sogar. Defensively for the White Sox, Pierre Rios and Quinton left center to right. Morale, Ramirez, Lillibridge, Canerco third to first. Flowers is the catcher. Edwin Jackson is the pitcher. So Rajay Davis steps in and Jackson's first pitch is a bit high. Davis hitting 274 with five home runs, 48 runs batted in. Good series for Rajay Davis. Five for 10, scored a couple of runs, has a couple of stolen bases. So Davis trying to finish the season strong. Slider, and Davis goes around one and two. Davis hitting over 300 in the month of September. So the A's facing the 27 year old Edwin Jackson. Six foot three, 210 pounder. Very good stuff. Inconsistent at times. They throw 149 pitches, it puts a lot of pressure on the, the manager at the time was A.J. Hinch of the Arizona Diamondbacks. I think that was uh, A.J. was still managing. 103, uh, 63 strikeouts for the right-hander. 189 and two-thirds innings. Good slide, a good live fastball. The A's saw him do very well against them in Detroit last year. Toward center field, Rios was shaded over toward right center, and he's right there to make the play. So out number one here in the bottom of the first, and that'll bring up Cliff Pennington. Last year on May the 15th at Detroit, there was a rain delay. Yep. A game in which Jackson went against Brett Anderson, a rematch. And Jackson was with the Detroit Tigers. Brett Anderson gave up nine runs, but only three earned. But Edwin Jackson, one of the first pitchers I've ever seen, to wait about an hour. Once the rains finally came, they did not start at the beginning of the game like everybody anticipated. When they came, it was about an hour rain delay. He came back out after four innings of pitching and threw harder than he did to start the game. That was very impressive. And he had about a 10 run lead, but he was pumping <laughs> it in there. Yeah. Remember the Giants had black Did not want to give up the, uh, the lead. 
Well, this was yeah, very nice today, Ray. Craig Breslow received the Dave Stewart Community Service Award just a couple of minutes ago. And well-deserved, obviously, for Craig Breslow. It's a, in recognition of charitable contributions throughout Northern California and across the nation. Boy, Craig Breslow has certainly done that. I know, Ray, you've talked a lot about the Strike Three Foundation, which has raised a large amount of money, and it's headed by Craig Breslow. Well, it's great for him to use his status as a major league pitcher and a very good one to help generate funds for his Strike Three Foundation. And of course, he's had his good friend Andrew Bailey at several of the functions, and probably all the functions out here. He's on his board of directors. Andrew heading back to have his right elbow checked out. That will be tomorrow, Dr. Andrews. But Craig Breslow was saying, of course, we were talking last night with Poof Bonzer, a former twin. Looked like he was going to finish it out instead of it was Craig Breslow. And Craig said uh, he had several text messages when he got back in the clubhouse last night from his former twin's teammates after <laughs> they you. clinched the division. And I, I hope he holds some of those text messages of the players. He said, we owe you part of a share for helping us get the postseason. Well, hold that text as evidence. But uh, he was very good closing out the ninth inning. He's off today. He's pitched four of the last five games, and even though his nickname is Never Say No, I think he might be saying no as well as the manager today in using him. He's, yeah, he's, good, yeah, he's been yeah. a good addition to the athletics. That well, he has. Strike Three Foundation was started in 2008 to help find a cure for childhood cancer. Two two pitch to Kurt Suzuki. That one's drilled to left center field, but Rios got a good jump. He gets back there, makes the catch, side retired. Both pitchers have three up, three down, first inning. Second inning coming up, no score. Pitching matchup today, Anderson and Jackson. And he's trying to sweep the White Sox and get ready for that big series coming up this weekend against the Rangers, which will be starting tomorrow night. So Anderson back to work. He'll face Canerco, Ramirez, and Carlos Quinton. Canerco pinch hit last night. Made the final out of the game with the bases loaded. This one's driven to center field. Rajay Davis to his right tracks it down. Well, Paul Canerco, quite a compliment to Gio Gonzalez. Gio, former member of the White Sox organization, but Paul Canerco said that he had never seen a curveball thrown any better by a lefty this year than what he saw from Gio Gonzalez on Monday night. 
course, players don't read a lot of papers. So I informed you Russian, of that, and his eyes Alabama, widen. Of course, 20, uh, he thinks a lot about Carlos, a lot of Ivan. Paul Kaderko and his great statue with the Chicago White Sox club. But that's quite a compliment, and uh, says a lot about Gio and his ability to pitch, and especially to throw the great curveball. So he gets another one this afternoon, Brett Anderson. Uh, this is Carlos Quinton. We may have had some type of lineup change because the lineup that we have, this is the Manny Ramirez spot. Quinton is hitting in the fifth spot, and Tyler Flowers is in the on deck circle. Everybody moved up. So we have not heard of a change, but exactly that's the way it looks right now. Manny Ramirez is the DH. And obviously he wouldn't be hitting any further down than fifth. You think he's still the DH? No, if he is, he's hitting seventh or lower because <laughs> Flowers is in the end deck circle, so he would be hitting in the sixth spot. So Manny heading up uh, with Alex Rios to go hit in the cage as they were not hitting on the field today. Well, I don't think Manny came to the White Sox to hit seven, did he? No, he did. <laughs> Quinton towards center. Rios has this one. Well, we'll just go with what's uh, the gentlemen that are coming up to the batter's box, and this is Tyler Flowers. And that's not Manny hitting the on deck circle, and that's not uh, Morell who's scheduled to hit. We have not heard any late. If there is a late lineup change, it's usually announced. At least it's always announced over the loudspeaker here in the press box. First pitch to Tyler Flowers is a strike. That's Nyan Viciedo. So that looks like the White Sox designated hitter. So Manny Ramirez must have been scratched. I see he's down on the bench supporting his teammates. Hey. So Tyler Flowers, the young catcher. Good breaking ball, and Flowers cannot hold up, so that's the strikeout. First strikeout for Brian Anderson. He's retired the first six White Sox hitters. Five ten thousand fans that day will get the 2010 set of A's baseball cards from Tops. The tickets now call 877-493 Ball or order online at OaklandAthletics.com. Steve Finella and his crew ready to take your orders for a 
nice weekend of baseball and actually a long weekend starting tomorrow night against the Rangers. First of a four game series. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday afternoon. Day games at the Coliseum. Can't ask for anything more than that. Jack Cust leading it off. He's clean up hitter. Cust Gross Iwamura. Edwin Jackson had a three up, three down first inning. To the right side. Lilla Bridge has it. So we got to talk about this 149 pitch no hitter. We've, yeah. We've Throw the numbers out there a lot. I don't know that we've ever really talked about it. I thought you said it right. You're putting your manager in a tough spot. Yeah. Because Jackson was healthy. Nothing wrong with him. We saw Slowy in Minnesota get pulled after seven innings, but he had missed a start with some soreness in his shoulder, elbow. And if you're the manager, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, yeah if, if really, he's healthy, but, you know, 149. I know. Wow. I know. And you're, you're putting yourself on the line. Now, I do recall, and I mentioned before, years ago when Tim Munsicum, and as you look at the numbers, there is the nine innings of no-hit baseball, eight walks and six strikeouts. It's a major league high, 149 pitches in 2010. Not surprising on that note. Because 120, 125, and you're really flirting with danger there. But I remember when Bruce Bochy had Tim Lincecum stay in the game as he had maybe a shutout or he's going to get the complete game, and you know, I think he said appropriately. It's important to put it on the resume that the guy can complete a game, especially in the category of Tim, Tim Lincecum, and that was the first of his back-to-back -back Cy Young awards. But 149 pitches yeah. is sitting at quite a bit. I guess if, if I was in the manager's shoes, I would have let him get the no-hitter as well, but it's easy for, for me to say up here. At the beginning of the season, down in uh, Tampa, CC Sabathia had a no-hitter, and he was going to come out mm -hmm. after seven innings. And Kelly Chopper uh, he got the, the hit to break it up, but Joe said he's not going to go beyond a certain number of pitches. Of course, that was, if not his first start, very close. And, you know, personal accomplishments are great, but you really have to think about an entire season, the full year, especially for a pitcher. And, Try to keep him available for 35 starts. And in the case of the Yankees postseason. And he goes around on the off speed pitch. That's his first strikeout. Well, Jackson, after the no hitter, which was on June 25th, his next start he made on July 2nd. So he had six days off. So they did give him a couple extra days. But whether this had anything to do with it, you just don't know. But if you look at just the plain numbers in his next five starts, he did not pitch very well. Now, who knows? I remember when uh, Brandon Morrow had the near no hitter for Toronto, and Cedar Gaston said, We just shut him down for a start. You know, it's just completely skipped it. Not given just one extra day, just skipped it and got at least 10, 11 days. He really never came back. That's why they shut him down for the season. We saw him here, and it wasn't even close. But that was a converted reliever with the Seattle Mariners last year. Put him in the rotation and continue with the Blue Jays, and he's going to be a good one in the future, but just had to build up his endurance, especially with the innings. And Jackson, you know, big, strong guy, but who knows how much that comes into play either. It's And I think too, if when you're throwing a no hitter, I mean, you may not have runners on base, but every pitch is a high stress pitch, <laughs> right? I mean, you're throwing a no hitter. Exactly. And that can take a little something out of your arm. He did get the no hitter, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. And you'll never know if any struggles he had after that were because of the 149 pitches. No hitters are great, but a situation like that probably sort of a nightmare for a manager. Three and two to Iwamira, and he swings and misses. A good pitch, nasty stuff from Edwin Jackson, as he has a couple of strikeouts in the bottom of the second. No scores. We head to the third.
Both pitchers sharp so far as Brett Anderson has retired the first six with a strikeout. He faces Viciedo, Morel, and Lillibridge. So, Diane Viciedo, powerful right handed hitter. Hit a big series against the A's in Chicago. Interesting to see what the White Sox do with this young man next year. He played third base in that series in Chicago, but can play first base. One and two to Viciedo. Seattle from Cuba. The White Sox signed him to a four year contract in December of 2008. He's 21 years old. The White Sox think that he has a very, very bright future. In the center field, the base hit, a breaking ball that stayed up, and Viciedo has a leadoff single. Well, Gary Radnich and Tony Bruno give you a new way to wrap up your sports weekend. Tune in Sunday night for the Sunday night wrap. Coming up at 9 o'clock on Sunday, it's on Comcast Sports Net California. Gary Tony together on TV for the first time. Radnich and Bruno, sports knowledge, they're full of it. Viciedo with the leadoff hit. Let's just hope he is not the hero today since he wasn't supposed to be in the game. You do see that sometimes. Yeah, unfortunately, too often. First hit and a solid base hit. First one against Brett Anderson. This is Brett Morrell. Could be two as the end of the bat goes flying, and the A's are going to turn the 4 6 3 double play, and the broken bat ends up right in the coach's box at third base. So Jeff Cox, the third base coach, <laughs> stepped out of the way of it. Well, fortunately, he was watching. And Ultra Mo, you see the bat, and assuming it's a maple bat, the way it shatters like that. And look out, Jeff. He is concentrating on the runner going to second. And a tailor made double play, especially once Pennington gets the ball. Is Eric Sogard playing second? Mark Ellis with the afternoon off. And Jeff Cox, that projectile. And Serious business. So two outs for Brent Lillibridge, the second baseman. There's a strike, one and one on the count. And I should talk to Steve Wilson, it's the longtime clubhouse manager for the athletics about these maple bats. He's reading a story about the ash, why more ash bats aren't being used. I said there's a lack of wood, right? Well, beetle said a beetle got into the wood and. <sighs> They said they had uh, several more million, I don't know, million bat or trees or acres, but there's a lot of it left. Yeah. I, I had heard that story too that yeah. something about ash wood being in short supply. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, how much truth there is to that. But. If you think about it, there's always been a, a concern about the aluminum bats for college and high school players, and why don't Professional clubs subsidize the the amateur ranks as far as wooden bats because they don't have to make that transition when they be sign a, a professional contract. But that's a lot of money. Those wooden bats cost uh, quite a bit of money, and when they break, as opposed to an aluminum bat, which probably never breaks. These uh, these bats that are breaking now are very dangerous, and we saw it Sunday with Tyler Colvin. Base hit for Lillibridge. Yeah, I'm sure. Collegiate athletic departments want nothing to do with paying for wood bats, oh, so no. it would have to be yeah. coming from Major League Baseball. Yeah. Brad Ziegler, very outspoken. He is the A's player right. representative, and this bat got him in the back by the number one, and he had a visible gash. And again, that was the the end, the broken end of the bat that got him. And he said he was sore for several days after that. 
I just saw the highlight today of the young man from the Cubs, Tyler Colvin, getting hit. He was a runner at third, coming down the line. Same thing, and it got him just below the collarbone, and actually did maybe even a little more damage than Ziegler. Well, they were talking. He's in the hospital about possible lung damage. He's obviously out for the year. Yeah. But in his case, you, you look at where it hit him in the left collarbone, the heart just below. He's got the head, the neck. I mean, very, very serious, yeah. and especially with that bat traveling at a very good speed, about 80, 80 feet away as he was coming down the line. Scary. Well, that, again, you don't want you don't want measures to be taken after it's too late. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, the big concern right now that something maybe should be done. That's a base hit for Juan Pierre. So back to back two out hits for the White Sox. Three hits in the inning. Well, the double play looming large. The White Sox two on two out for Alexi Ramirez. Okay. A fastball inside. Pierre able to turn on it and look at this lineup as I mentioned. Predominantly right handed hitters and just Pierre. Anderson made a great play on in the first inning leading off but this one no chance. Not pretty good speed on the bases especially at first. Ramirez bounced out to the shortstop. Two for eight now in the series. Both the hits last night, both doubles for Ramirez. Back to back sliders that Ramirez has not offered at. And if he throws a fastball, you figure he's going to be sitting on a fastball 2 0. He takes that fastball, but it's low, so 3 0. Ramirez, much a free swinger. He has walked 25 times this year. He struck out 78. Takes that fastball right down the middle, 3 1. He'll take that one. He will not take another one. This one's popped up. Sogar, the second baseman, is right there. Side retired. So the White Sox get three hits, but they do not score. Bottom of the third coming up. By Cash Creek's Cash Perfect 10 giveaway. From now until October 10th, thousands will win cash and prizes every day. Visit CashCreek.com for details. 
Beautiful day. Not a bad place to be right there. First pitch to Chris Carter is lying down the left field line and it's fouled by about a foot. So Carter just got out ahead of that one a little bit. Well, he is strong. And especially when he gets out on the front foot, but it's very strong upper body keep on the back back and he is going to be just fine. And I think it's great that Bob Guerin continues to put in the lineup. To see, as he mentioned to us, the interview last night, post game about he's taking the brace the protection off his hand where he injured it, in Sacramento towards the end of the season. Chris Carter's original team, Ray, was the Chicago White Sox. 15th round pick of the White Sox in 2005. Played just one year in the minor leagues with the White Sox and then. Was traded to the Arizona Diamondbacks for Carlos Quinn. And then, of course, coming over in the Dan Heron trade to the Athletics. Just looking at his minor league number, excuse me, Ray, but really, including this year, he only had six full seasons in the minor league. So he's had plenty of minor league at bats. So hopefully, he's made the proper adjustments. Or at least close to it. That one's driven to left. Pierre is back. Look it up. Go. Ah. Throw it back, folks. Uh, though those guys out there are pretty smart. They know it's his first one. And a no doubter. That ball was crushed. Look at him just drop the head of the bat down on a low sinker coming into his right kneecap. And big boy, that smoked. You don't have to run hard at first base. He's running, then shut it down. I know he does not want to cock this trot, but he could have started at home plate with that trot because that ball was crushed. Ramirez, the shortstop out. Juan Pierre in, and Pierre fighting that sun makes the catch. So Jeff Larish is retired. Just watch the quickness of this bat. The sound. Strider looking, but there was no doubt this ball was going into the seats, and the bleacher creatures got it. And Ultramo watched the head of the bat. Look at the front foot. That is Hank Aaron, folks. I mean, that is that's so much like Hammer and Hank. When you get out on the front foot, it's all wrists. Just let it go and pop it. And so he was looking for his first hit for 33 at bats. Only has three hits, but now his first major league home run. You can say he got it against the guy pitched a no hit. Edwin Jones, track. Right. You watch that swing, though. And what it is, Ray, is it's a pretty short, quick yeah. swing for a big guy, which I think that's what makes him attractive when you think about what kind of hitter he may be. Well, you look at a lot of hitters that just reverse where they're back and then kind of lift a little bit, but. His is forward and then with the top head of the bat on it. When I think too, a lot of times you see younger hitters, maybe their swing is a little long, and as they continue to get better, the swing shortens up a little bit, and that helps. Them. His looks like it's pretty tight, compact swing with a lot of power. Well, that's a first base runner, first hit against Edwin Jackson. He retired six straight, including a couple of strikeouts. So Chris Carter. I enjoyed reading a couple of articles where his parents, of course, talking about their son and saying that he's always hit home runs. It's just a matter of time. In every classification where he started, he struggled, but picked it up as he has done here at the major league level. Rajay Davis hit a fly ball to center field. He had a good swing there on a fastball. The count even at one and one. So the A's with a one nothing lead thanks to. Chris Carter's first major league home run. 
And we've talked about teams and the success of Cincinnati Reds in particular. A great September last year, and it's carried over in this 2010 season, closes to clinching the Central Division of the National League. It's the same for individual players. You have a great September, a call up that could carry over definitely into the next year. Let's take a look at the home run again. First one for Chris Carter. First of what we hope is many. One nothing eight. One nothing lead over the White Sox. Pennington in the hole, throws on the run, and it's not quite in time. Rios runs well, and he just beat the throw. So leadoff infield single for Alex Rios, and here's our trivia question, which is brought to you by AT&T. Name the only White Sox player in the last 56 years to have a 200-hit season. 56 years. That's a long time. I don't like the fact that going back 56 years. It's say a lot, maybe. Maybe it's that time. Frank Thomas, that name pops up. But Frank always walked a lot too. That may have kept his hit total down a little bit. Going back 56 years, you might be going back to Luis Aparicio. That's true. Breaking ball is a strike. One and one to Canerco. Miniman also had a whole bunch for about five different decades. Kept coming back to put on the uniforms of the White Sox. Great mini. And those rest is many minutes. Back to Anderson, spins, throws to second for one, back to first, double play. They pulled him off at second, he's called oh, safe at second. safe at second, you're right, Bob Guerin's going to. And that's to me, you know, come on, it's the neighborhood. How many times, that was Mike Wilitsky, oh, it's a shock. You know, they talk about protecting the guys at second, and now all of a sudden they're going to be critical of a guy at second base. Unfortunately, they got Canerco at first. Red Anderson threw the ball a little bit high to the shortstop side. Sogard coming across. I mean, really, you could say he's trying to avoid the slide by Rios going in at him hard. And if it upended him, what are you going to do now there? Number 20, Carlos Quentin. That's too close to make it a safe call. Sorry. Just doesn't happen that often. So Carlos Quinton hits with a runner in scoring position.
Blackman in a fly ball to center field in the second inning. Just five hits in his last 34 at bats. Quentin's breakout season was his first after that trade that we just told you about with Chris Carter. 2080 at 288 with 36 home runs and 100 runs back then. Last year, injuries hurt him and he played in just 99 games. Well, if you recall how he got hurt in that great season, it really hurt the White Sox because he just had a habit of. Kind of banging his right hand on the bat and hit it wrong and fractured a bone. Yeah, that 08 season, he played in 130 games, so he missed a month's worth of games, maybe even a little bit more. Yeah, so he would have had even bigger numbers. at the end of the season. I watch Alex Rodriguez also and kind of swings and misses. He hits the yep. bat with his hand, and you know, you mess around small bones in your hand, and you just Good and bad is not going to move. It's not going to budge. And you hit it hard. Oh, wow. Rios goes. They got him picked off. And he is out at third base. He was going. So it'll go down as a caught stealing. But Anderson spun around, made a good play. And the A's get Rios off the bases anyway. One of the best moves for a pitcher, and that is to make the spin move. Somebody may have yelled, maybe he looked back and just continued with a spin towards second base and a throw. To third, Iwamura. That is a great play by Brett Anderson. 3 1 pitch, very close, but it's a walk. First walk Not issued by you. Anderson. He's got one strikeout so far. First pitch to Tyler Flowers is a strike. Most in the majors this year. Not surprised by that. Of course, Dallas Braden, very good. Anderson, good. 77 total in that period of time. To right field, and it's playable for Gabe Gross. He's got it. Side retired. Runner left for the White Sox. We go to bottom of the fourth. One nothing. Fifty-six years, they have a 200-hit season. 
How about this, Ray? Albert Bell in 1998, right on the button, 200 hits. What if that's the year he had 50 home runs and 50 doubles? Tell you in a minute. 100 extra base hits. Because he, uh, I think, was the first since Stan Musial to accomplish that. Not a bad year. Huh? Pennington, Suzuki, and Cust here in the bottom of the fourth. These with the one nothing lead. Pennington hits one very high. Juan Pierre fighting that sun. So Rios takes over and Rios has it. You know what, Ray? It was. 1995 when he had 52 doubles and 50 homers. So yeah. that was not the year. No, but in Cleveland. Right? Right. In Cleveland. The catcher. I think he was playing for Cleveland at the time. Kurt Suzuki. Signed a free agent contract with the White Sox. Yeah. With the fences way back. And then he went to Baltimore. And with the contract there, he became the highest paid golfer in all of sports. Because he was playing for the Orioles on the disabled list and making money playing golf every day. Had the hip injury. That one lying foul down the right field line by Kurt Suzuki. We were talking about uh, before the game about Edwin Jackson's former team, the Arizona Diamondbacks, one of the record books. <laughs> with, four, with a few games. 1,400 strikeouts. That was Adam LaRoche last night against the Rockies. <laughs> and they just added to it. So 1,403. And they have 11 games to go. The old record was the Brewers, 1,399 in 2001. And listen, I, you know, guys strike out. That's okay, but you can't tell me that. Hey, it's okay to strike out 200 <laughs> times. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't think it is. No. When you. Are doing something. Listen, to strike out. I, I guess you could consider it one negative, out. right? Yes, one out. Yeah. <laughs> That's only one out. Church community day is this Saturday at 1:05 p.m. when the A's host the Texas Rangers. Fans are invited to a post-game event, and it's featuring Donnie Moore and the outstanding Radical Reality Team, and to hear testimonials by A's players. In addition. Groups of 25 or more will receive a special A's testimony card. For more information, visit OaklandAthletics.com. Saw Donnie Moore last night, and he said, it's unbelievable where people are getting busloads coming in for Saturday's game from all around Northern California. And someone was saying they were in Las Vegas. They heard our telecast talking about the, the great event on Saturday. And if you want to see some outstanding feats right behind the A's dugout on Saturday. You're going to see. We, we just showed on Diamond Vision. They showed some guy breaking watermelons with his head. The Radical Reality it's Team. A great video, huh? Yeah. Super video. Radical Reality. They, they <laughs> break bricks with their heads. They don't even mess around with soft watermelons. Now, these guys are unbelievable. So, get a chance. Come out Saturday. Of course, a big game at 105 against the Rangers. Great baseball and closing out this home season, or at least the home schedule for the season. One and one to Jack Cust. So getting back to that Diamondbacks thing, right? The, the second closest team to Arizona as far as total strikeouts this year is the Florida Marlins, 1,262. <laughs> so that's like give or take whatever. It's like 140 more strikeouts than any other team in baseball. It's amazing. Well, I just check this out. Uh, you got Reynolds, LaRoche, Upton. Chris Young, Kelly Johnson, all of these have at least 100. Reynolds at 202. LaRoche, 157. Upton, 152. Young, 134. Johnson, 133. Five of the starting nine, well over 100 strikeouts. So you load the bases, you got three of those guys coming up. You got a chance to get out of the inning yes, without making do. contact. Yes, you do. Jeff Cuss strikes out. Cust is the only guy on the A's that has struck out more than 100 times. That was number 104 for him. Right, just a good fastball, challenging fastball, and that could not catch up to it. Jackson, just a nice, easy delivery. And a live fastball and good off-speed pitches. So that's the the argument, right? A guy like Mark Reynolds, who's a terrific power hitter. We're talking 40 home runs, 45 home runs. And he strikes out. 
a record amount. He has said, hey, it doesn't matter. It's an out. It's one out. And you sort of see his side of the story. He may be saying, listen, if I don't swing that way where I swing hard and I strike out a lot, if I don't do that, I'm not going to hit 45 home runs. Okay, th there's his argument. I'm not saying I agree with it, but that's his argument. Well, let us look at the story of Jose Bautista this year. Right. He's a guy who swings hard. He's at 49, assuming he's not hit his 50th yet. But he knows the strike zone, and he'll walk. Gabe Gross grounds outside, retired, and we are headed to the fifth inning. He's one. White Sox, nothing. A little bit. Brett Anderson has allowed four hits in the game. He's got a couple of. He's got one double play. He's also helped out with a caught stealing. He got Rios when Rios took off for third between second and third. That'd be the biggest play of the game yep. so far for him to. Take a runner out of score position, especially with just one out. Went to the plate. One point six five ERA in September. This one's popped up, then it'll reach the seats. So one and two the count to Diane Viciedo. Pitch number 62 for Anderson. Pennington charges. He's got it. Straightens up and throws out. Time now for our Subway Eat Fresh Ask Glennon Ray question. Joe Page from Fremont asks, how does a reliever receive a hold? As a personal stat, 15 yard penalty. That's right. Can't do it. Put your team in a hole. All right, All right here's, the, here's the definition. If a reliever comes into a game with a lead of no more than three runs, gets at least one out, and leaves without giving up that lead, he gets a hold. That's it. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's one of those stats. It's a little misleading. I, and I hope you don't take it to arbitration. No, and they probably do. Of course it did. But it is, it is a stat, but it's sort of, I thought they were called setup. I mean, 
set up relievers, and that's your job to get to the closer. So you could give up two runs and get just one out and get a hold as long as you don't give up the lead. Now, Tommy adds in our in the award winning director just asked, and a good point. How many would Rick Honeycutt have gotten back in the days of the late 80s at three consecutive trips to the World Series and setting up Dennis Sanders with his automatic save? There is Zach, and well, it'd be nice to see another number 34 up there by the name of Dave Stewart. How would that be? That's one of the great things about. I mean, if you look at those retired numbers, they're all in the Hall of Fame. But there are a lot of clubs that have team Hall of Fame. And look at the Yankees. Not all of their retired numbers are guys in the Hall of Fame. No, Dave Stewart, PA, very team deserved. Hall of Fame idea. Absolutely. It's completely different than the regular yeah. Hall of Fame. And maybe it's something the A's will do once they get in the new stadium. Ultra Mo. This is what Ed Hickok saw and probably could have rung him up for strike three. So the count stays three and two to Brent Morrell. If you look at what certain players have meant to an organization, Ron Gedrick's not in the Hall of Fame, but his number's retired. I mean, Darwin Munson, of course, passed away, unfortunately. But Dave Stewart could have two 34s up there. The Yankees have two number eights. 3 2 pitch and another foul ball. Yeah, and you don't have to have a huge impact on an organization by playing there for 10, 12 years. Dave Stewart, how long was he in athletics? Six, seven years? Yeah, long enough to win at least 24 consecutive exactly. years, including right. that year, the MVP of the World Series in 89 against the Giants in a four game sweep. High fly ball center field. Rajay Davis underneath it. And he's got it out number two. So that'll bring up Brent Lillibridge, the ninth place hitter. Now batting, number 18, Brent Lillibridge. Well, the A starters, because of the off day and the fact that Bobby Kramer, who will pitch Friday night, was kept in the rotation, so all these starters are getting an extra day's rest, which should help. Trevor Cahill going 109 last night. Brent Anderson to see how this game progresses, but. The banged up bullpen and some players leaders not available and might see Brett extend his his game today, especially just his 17th start of the season. Hey. So what is he is pitching? <laughs> Don't even consider it. Little bridge line to single the right field. In the third inning. This one sliced down the right field line, but that'll drop foul. He's pulled by Scott Linebrink, the reliever for the White Sox. I'm looking for a White Sox fan. We understand that. We found Carlton Fisk in the house. Worst uniform in baseball history. There it is. Especially with the Bermuda Shorts. <laughs> Sorry, White Sox. I don't think I'm the only one who's ever said that. Harold Baines warm. He's the first yeah. base coach for the White Sox. Mr. Talkative, the talkative one, Harold Baines. The replacement, he is hopping around, feeling great. One of the real good guys in the game. This one looped on the right field line. Gross is on the move, and he makes the catch. Stepped into fair territory. Side retired. So another good inning for Brett Anderson. We're headed to the bottom of the fifth. One nothing A's.
Post game live. Jim Cosmore, Bill Romanowski, Tony Bruno. The Raiders game isn't over until we say it is. Complete Raiders coverage is on every night on Comcast Sportsnet Central and always on CSNCalifornia.com. A's leading one to nothing over Edwin Jackson. Iwamura leading things off. Iwamira, Carter, and Larish on the fifth. Iwamira struck out his first at bat. Ray, we were talking about the Arizona Diamondbacks. They have a new GM. Kevin, Kevin Towers Tyler. just got named to that position. So Kevin Towers, longtime general manager of the Padres. 15 years he was the general manager in San Diego. So he takes over that Arizona team. Was he the new sheriff in San Diego? No. No, that was the guy that took over for the Dodgers. Kevin Malone. Kevin Malone. That's that went over well. <laughs> <laughs> I bet if Kevin Malone could do it again, he would not have said that. That's a good point. But Kevin Towers did a good job with the Padres. And he had to rebuild a couple times there, and he always seemed to do a pretty good job. Well, evidently the club that's there now is a result exactly. of, of what sure he did. Which is a, a credit to him, and I'm sure that helped him get the job in Arizona. They do have their interim manager. So he'll have a difficult decision to make immediately. Do we keep Kirk Gibson? You mm -hmm. and strikes out. And do you want to be the guy to say, you know what, Kirk, we're going to go in a different direction? Now, hey, number 22. So Chris Carter steps in. Big moment for Carter in the third inning as he hit a home run to left field. First home run in his career. Swing and a miss on the fastball. Jackson comes right back and challenges him with the 94 mile an hour heater. Guys, big Ray, when a decent size bat looks really small, yeah. as <laughs> Carters does. Now, they get a chance to see this a lot of times. A 3 2 fastball down and in with some sinking action, and he just dropped that. It looks like a small bat, the head of the bat on the fastball, and he crushed it, got it out very quickly. Another fastball inside. I wonder. Uh, the person who caught the ball, if they'd been escorted to the visiting or the home clubhouse, and negotiations have started as to what he will receive for. Chris Carter's first ball, Steve Businets, no doubt the best at negotiating. This was a, a visitor that had been thrown the back ball back. Sure, make it nice and easy. Jack Cuss got his 100th in Kansas City when they threw it back and they cheered him. So thank you. Fastball low. Jackson 97 miles an hour as he reached back that time. But the count is full now with yes. Larish in the on deck circle. As it was in the third inning when got the sinker down and in. Swing and a miss as Jackson gets his fifth strikeout. So he gets Iwamura and Carter. Well, this is where the patience eventually is going to have him go to first base. This out of the strike zone. And maybe thinking more of the pitch inside in ultra mo. Pitch outside, no contact. The pitch clearly out of the strike zone. But I think all he has to do is look at his home run and just realize. He just reacted. He reacted on the pitch that was down and in, and the way the ball jumped off his bat, there's no reason to try to start a swing any sooner to try to catch up to a good fastball. Larry should have fly ball to the left field in the third inning. 
getting the chance to play first base today. A bouncer slowly hit towards second. Lillibridge juggles a little bit, but it has time to get Larish. So Edwin Jackson, a three up, three down inning. We're on to the sixth. Still one nothing A's. Product being used by baseball clubs. There's also a product for fans. Improve your fantasy player or track your favorite players and teams. Go to BloombergSports.com for details. One to nothing. The A's leading the White Sox is Brett Anderson. Very sharp. And here he will face the top of the White Sox order. Pierre, Ramirez, and Rios. Four hits for Chicago. They stranded three through the first five innings. One walk. One strikeout for Brett Anderson. This is the only game being played right now. There was a game that finished earlier. The Twins, after their celebration last night, got right back to work today, and they beat the Cleveland Indians 5 to 1. But that is the only other game. Everything else is tonight. I don't believe anybody has a chance to clinch a playoff spot. Magic numbers are all there. But the Twins, they're still battling yeah. for that best record. And so their win now, they're 92nd of the year. So they're just a half game behind the Yankees for the best record. That best record would be first two rounds of the playoffs. World Series. First time in a long time the National League will have the home field advantage. And then hit Pierre. If it didn't, it came close to it. Well, either way, he's going to be a board. But I think he got out of the way, but it's ball four. It was very close. Well, they try to pitch him in. They tried last time when he got a base hit to right field. Well, Suzuki this time outside, and Brett just left it inside. Obviously unintentional as the ultra Mo trying to get out of the way, turned away from the pitch, and was able to avoid being hit. So the leadoff man is aboard. Here's Ramirez, and of course Pierre, a huge base stealing threat. He leads the majors and steals. Looks like he just faked a draw throw. 
very quick. Swing and a miss. Now, Juan Pierre has 59 steals. That's a lot. He's also been thrown out 18 times. So it was a hit by pitch. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. A graze. There's a shot into the glove of a diving Iwamura. Ramirez stood at home plate. He couldn't believe it. Well, it's a double and probably a run, considering the speed of Pierre at first base. But Iwamura in on the grass. He just a dive, a quick dive to his right. And as far as he was off the bag, that easy would have been a fair ball. Guys, it could really run. Well, it's Rio steps up. That Anderson did a good job when he throws the plate. He's doing a slide step quick pitch and trying to freeze. Here at first base, if he does go on first move with a slide step, should enable Kurt Suzuki to make a good throw. There it is again. Very huge lead, and he's dancing around, not going anywhere. And this one's hit high, right field line, and it's going to be into the seat. That's how I thought uh, Brett Anderson did it perfectly as the big lead by Pierre. So I'm get way off the bag, but as he started to go back to first base, Pierre, that's when Anderson threw to the plate. Yeah. So with that momentum going back towards the bag, even with the big lead, he was not going to be able to take off. There and it's one and two to Rios. Paul Canerco in the on deck circle. Active career leaders. Juan Pierre, the most stolen bases among active players. See Ichiro's name on that list. He is three hits away from 200. He was four for four. Oh, last it's a night. shock. Yeah, so he's going to get there. It'll be his 10th straight 200 hit season for Ichiro Suzuki. Will not break his own 262 hits. No. But every year, 200 at least. The team that's closest to the postseason right now, the Yankees actually have a magic number of three to clinch a playoff spot. Not the division, but a playoff spot. Bounce to short. The A's are going to get one, and they're going to get a double play. Brett Anderson, the big pitch again. So Rios hits into the 6-4-3 double play, and the White Sox do not score.
Light Freeze Can. Coors Light Freeze Cam is brought to you by Frost Brewed. Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. Good ball game today with a 1-0 A's lead as we have reached the bottom of the sixth inning. Eric Sogard, the second baseman, to lead it off. It's a base hit in the right center field. Sogard goes after the first pitch. So he has his second major league hit. That's good. He was hitting 3-3-3 coming to the game. Freeze it. Freeze can. 3-33. Pitch outside. Looking fastball and got it. And able to pull it in the right center. Good shot. Good lead off with a little speed at the bottom of the order. And now Davis and Pennington. Cliff Pennington moving up in the second spot today. Jay Davis, a couple of fly balls to center field. Sogard takes off. Throw to second base is in the dirt, but dug out by Ramirez, and he puts the tag on Sogard. Well, a very nice play by the shortstop, Alexi Ramirez. Well, and Rajay Davis looking, Mike Gallego looking at the dugout. Sogard did not get a particularly great jump, stumbled a little bit out of the box, and just get the ball quickly to second base. Ramirez straddling the bag perfectly with the short hop. Able to make the tag. Sogard sliding through the bag anyway. You probably heard that he was called out. So, busted hit and run. Something going on. One on one the count to Rajay Davis. Swing and a miss says that is strikeout number six for Edwin Jackson. Well, the pitching matchups are in for this upcoming series against the Texas Rangers, and there they are. Cliff Lee, Dallas Braden tomorrow, Hunter Kramer on Friday, Holland Gonzalez on Saturday, Lewis Cahill on Sunday. So C.J. Wilson is the guy the Rangers will not face, or the A's will not face from that Rangers rotation. The Rangers won't see. Ben Anderson. So Pennington hit by a pitch with two outs and nobody on. And now we're even. Yeah, try to go inside and. Now that he, the catcher. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> One run game. No. But you never know. That's one thing about this great game, you just never know. So here's Suzuki. And if it happened to be what you suggested, and we're still second, driving in, and then sure. I'm just saying, it's not out of the question. I in the dirt. Suzuki has hit a fly ball to center field, and he has a base hit. That was in the fourth inning. Jackson with that nice, easy delivery, and the ball gets on the hitter very quickly. It's bright, sunny day. It might be a little tough, tough picking up the ball.
Pennington does not have a real big lead at first. There he goes. Throw to second base is not in time as he just got in there. So Pennington with the stolen base. It's not a throw by Flowers, the catcher. This time a little bit more accurate, did not bounce it. But the slide, and this time Ramirez took the ball in front of the bag. And look where Pennington goes to the outside, the back of the bag. And Ramirez could not reach back and tag him. All the difference in where you catch the ball is middle infield. He did a great job on the bounced throw, but not on this one. So for Cliff Pennington, 25th stolen base of the year. One of the greatest shots. Come up with this slide showing the guy going to second base. Maybe show it again just to how they veer to the outside of the bag, knowing that the infielder is taking the throw in front of the bag. Take a look at this. Cliff Pennington, look where he's going. Watch this. Starts going to his right. See, he, he knows where the shortstop's taking the throw. He actually reaches out and catches the bag with his hand. What a great shot. And he knows. That there's no chance for Ramirez to catch it that far in front of the bag and tag him, and that's why he veers to the outside, grabs the bag with his hand. Great shot. So Cus steps in with two on and two out. You saw that. Note on the stolen bases, he's tied for second in the American League in steals, and the team they're tied with for second is the Chicago White Sox. They both have 144 steals now. The team that leads the American League is the Rays with 162. Cust 0 for 2, a ground out and a strikeout, trying to come through with a two out hit. Eighty one pitches for Edwin Jackson. Lays off that pitch and drops low, two and one. Oh, Ramirez is behind the bag at second. Entire left side is open. The ground ball, because third baseman Morell has to play somewhat close to the bag, still off quite a distance. There's a shot to right, that's a base hit. Carlos Quinton picks it up. His throw to the plate. Offline and Cuss comes through with a two-out RBI hit. Pennington scores to give the A's the two-to-nothing lead. How about that hit batter? The two outs. Then a walk to Suzuki following the stolen base, and Jack Cuss does come through to drive in the second run for the Athletics. The two-one, forget about the left side. He pulled an outside fastball. Past the shift, and with Quentin's strong arm, there's no doubt Pennington was going to be sent. He made it easily as a throw way offline. Federico had to cut the ball. So Jack Cust with a two out hit and a big one. So a hit batter, and now a chance for the walk to score if he can. Gabe Gross can come up with a hit. Strikeout and a ground out for Gabe Gross. Bounces this one to Carco, who gives ground and fires to Jackson, and Jackson was able to keep his foot on the bag. Side retired. A's get a run on Cuss RBI single, so we are headed to the seventh inning. It's the A's two and the White Sox nothing.
Performance brought to you by Nation's Giant Hamburgers. Last night, Trevor Cahill won his 17th game of the season. First athletic since 2004. Won that many games, he won eight innings, striking out seven, allowed just six hits. Trevor Cahill, 17 and six on the year. When you've got a giant appetite, it's got to be Nations. 17 and seven, I should say. But he said the first four innings, he might have had his best stuff all year. And we could see it. Gave up a walk and just a hit. Backdoor curveball working perfectly. But Anderson's had good stuff today. He faces Kunerko, Quinton, and Flowers. Two walks, just one strikeout for Anderson. Well, according to the pitch count, the A's might need a couple of innings out of the bullpen. Depends what happens. This inning is. What is it? 94? Maybe because it's just his 17th start that maybe he can expand, extend his pitch count. Canerco toward the hole. Pennington throws across, and Canerco's retired, and that's one out. Now you're very observant, and I know Mikey over here is very observant. What what is unusual about today's game? See anything about Nobody. what's unusual, Nobody. Mikey? Come on, pay Carlos attention. Quentin. Both teams are wearing black jerseys. Good call. That's it's not allowed. The home team has the right to name or okay. at least to consider the jersey. The White Sox, I think, on day games wear black, uh -huh. but the A's. Brett Anderson wanted to wear it black today. Carlos Quinton is going to have a one out double. So the White Sox actually were informed that the A's were going to wear black jerseys okay. and they should have been wearing their gray. Huh. The Empire <laughs> said, let them. Can we protest? No, but you know, I'm we sure. Need a win. Can we I'm sure somebody, no, I don't think you protest, but I'm sure somebody is watching and wondering why this is happening. The uniform police. Yeah. Because yeah. unless if you throw to somebody, you better throw somebody if you're with the A's white pants. Sure. Otherwise it's gray. Booth Bonzer is gonna get up. So the double for Carlos Quinton hit number five for the White Sox. It's their first extra base hit. And this is Tyler Flowers, who is 0 for 2 with a strikeout. And a fly ball to right field. And swing and a miss there. So three games, we've seen three different catchers for the White Sox. Castro, Brzezinski, and now Flowers. Do you think Castro wanted to catch on a day like today after... Facing Joe Gonzalez and knowing that Brett Anderson has the same type of breaking pitch. Yeah, he's right where he wants to be. <laughs> and you throw him another one. That time Flowers takes it and drops low. Two and two the count. Viciedo is in the on deck sir. Breaking ball just a bit high. Not by much. Three and two. He throw it again, three and two, the hard slider. He does, and it just gets tapped foul up in front of home plate. Like Gio Gonzalez, Brett Anderson throws the hard slider, the curveball to the right hander's the back foot, and it is to get a swing, perhaps even at a bad pitch, a pitch out of the strike zone, not necessarily to throw it in the middle of the plate for a called strike. With the aggressiveness of the hitter to swing through it. It's driven to center. Rajay Davis going back, still going back. He's going to have room, and he makes the catch. And will allow Quinton to tag up and go to third, but that is out number two. I think the outfielder ever gets a little bit worried, concerned when he backs up like that, and then the ball starts sinking on him. It did. Look yes, like it. it did. A little bit towards the end of the bat. Flowers, a good swing. Rajay went back, timed it perfectly, then turned around and watched the ball start to dive, sink, and he caught it by belt high. Ooh. 
man. I mean, as much as they're out there and catch fly balls, but I wonder about it sometimes if they're good outfielders. Breaking ball to Viciedo is hot. Jay and Ultramo. Semi basket catch to the side and got the job done. Ball and a good one. Vicieto on a foul tip swings with one and two or one and one. The count. Vicieto is one for two. They sit in the third inning. Hundred and six pitches now for Brett Anderson. Pitch outside that time. Now the hard one down on the end. See if he can get him on the next one of two pitches. Fastball in. Close pitch. Three and two. Down the three. Yep. And there's a line drive base hit. Broken bat, but a line drive nonetheless. And Viciedo comes through as Quinton scores, and it's two to one. And he left the slider up. Did not throw it to the back foot. And Kurt Suzuki does a good job of blocking those pitches, but he left it up. And it's like Anderson's not going to get the finish this inning. And Smith Bonds was going to be called. So Anderson six and two thirds this afternoon and when it's time for a change think speedy oil change in tune up your oil change tune up and smog expert sponsor coming in. Plan Athletics and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Athletics Investment Group, LLC. Brett Anderson, 107 pitches, and he pitched very well today. Probably a little frustrated right now, giving up that two-out RBI single to Viciedo. Booth Bonzer who takes over and Bonzer's first pitch to Brent Morell is a strike on the outside corner. Bonzer has been pitching well as of late for the Athletics. A little, little different role for Booth with Andrew Bailey out and today a couple of guys not available so he's doing a great job. Not a bad guy to have the veteran that he is to be able to pitch. And 
Monday night, his first win since June 4th of 2008, missing all of last season. It's the seventh inning. He scored three in the bottom of the seventh. Breaking ball in the dirt to Morrell, who is 0 for 2 today, 1 for 10 in the series. It's the eighth big league start for Brent Morrell at third base. Breaking ball outside three and one. Lillibridge is in the on deck circle. So a full count with two outs. VC80 will take off at first base. Both bullpens quiet. Now Booth has an outstanding curveball. He talked about uh, visiting a lot with Burt Blyleven when he was with the Twins, trying to pick up some pointers from the great right-hander. Seattle goes and a fastball swing and a miss by Morrell and Bonzer comes in and gets the final out in the seventh inning. Seventh inning stretch coming up 2 1 athletics. Brought to you by Toyota. More people say yes to Toyota than any other brand in California. Learn why at your Toyota dealer today. By Xfinity, TV, phone, and internet. Reinvented. And by Chevy with a full lineup of award-winning cars, trucks, and crossovers. Ace two, White Sox one. Bottom of the seventh inning, Edwin Jackson stays in the ball game. He's throwing 84 pitches through the first six innings. He's with a run in the third on Chris Carter's solo home run and a run in the sixth on a Jack Cuss two out RBI single. Iwamura has struck out twice against Jackson. Followed by Carter and then Larish. This one bounced slowly to Canerco, who grabs it and steps on the bat. So Iwamura is 0 for 3. It's always great to see Iwamura hit a ball to the opposite field with his swing and just cannot, a lot of times, find the ball through the infield and you just stay away from him as Jackson did with a 2 0 fastball, just running away and tried to pull it right to Canerco. If the guy has one swing, it's kind of tough to change it. Especially with the location of the pitch. So one out for Carter. Homer and a strikeout for Carter. And he 
swings and misses at the fastball from Jackson. Jackson has six strikeouts in the game. He has one, one. So he has pitched very well today. The biggest thing about Jackson is his nice, easy delivery, and then the ball just explodes, gets on you very quickly. As a hitter, you look at that and say, well, I've got a little time, and all of a sudden it's on you. Driven to center. Rios back now in. And that's out number two. This Friday, the A's play game two of their final home series of the season when they host the Rangers. First pitch, 705, 10,000 fans that night will get a 2010 A's team photo. And it's brought to you by Comerica Bank. Get tickets online at oaklandathletics.com or call 877-493-BALL. It's the beginning of a great weekend of baseball and promotions. Coliseum. Against the Rangers, the team in first place in the division. It's a good way to finish up the home portion of the schedule. Again, tomorrow night is when that big series starts. We'll have it for you right here on Comcast Sportsnet California. 6.30, A's pregame live. The game at 7. Dallas Braden, Cliff Lee. So the pitching matchup, a good one. And the series should be a good one. Driven to left. Pierre's going back. It's going to be over his head and off the wall. He gets it quickly, fires it back in, but Larish will slide into second with a two out double. Well, that's aggressiveness of Jeff Larish and opposite field. I mean, when he makes contact, ball travels. We saw at Yankee Stadium this one in the opposite field, a pitch that was up, but a very strong swing by Larish. And Juan Pierre had no. No chance to catch the ball. Played the carom back, but does not have a strong arm. There's for the two out double. So Sogard will hit. Fastball to Sogard is a bit high. Sogard had that hit in the sixth inning. Grounded out in the third inning. One and one the count. So Mark Ellis getting the afternoon off. Derek Barton getting the afternoon off. Kevin Kuzman off on the lineup today. I thought Steve Sales brought up a very good point talking to him about some of the various injuries that you have an injury, you miss time as Kevin Kuzminoff did. You guy comes back doesn't mean he's going to play every day. No. No. In the case of Kuz played last night, day game after a night game, tough to recover within less than 24 hours. And guys are definitely banged up this time of the year, but boy, it's time when you see guys play through some real tough, tough times. Knowing that a lot is on the line and just got to keep playing. See, Mark Ellis was ready though. He was glove yeah. on, glasses on. In the dirt, Sogard takes it to even up the count at two and two. Mark Ellis will be in second, starting the eighth inning. Derek Barton had his glove on too. You may see Derek Barton. Sogard. 
Nice play by Lillibridge. Throws, and he throws wide. And that's going to allow a run to come in and score. So the A's get their third run. And another defensive mistake by the White Sox. They have played very poorly defensively in this series. Well, Lillibridge got to the ball and probably had a little more time than he took. And he tried to rush it and hold Paul Canerco off the back. Here's the great play. What of the slide? And look how much time he had, but then the bad throw. And Flowers, the catcher with the runner in scoring position, could not back up. So that ball just kept rolling and rolling and allowed Larish to score. And the ever good Ultra Mo, nice play by Lillibridge at that point. But then an errant throw, Paul Canerco cannot handle it. Tried to change direction, the footwork for Canerco, and just off his glove. Great break for the Athletics. Pop up, Flowers flips the mask. He's got it side retired. So the A's. Get an unearned run in the bottom of the seventh. They'll take it. We go to the eighth. Three to one athletics. Comcast Sportsnet California, the first of four. The A's and the first place Rangers. Braden and Lee is your pitching matchup tomorrow night. Coverage begins at 6.30 with A's pregame live. The home of A's baseball is Comcast Sportsnet California. Edwin Jackson trailing 3-1. to one, Did not get much help from his defense in the bottom of the seventh. The A's will take it. The White Sox, Ray, in this series have made six errors. And it has cost them every time. Lillibridge swings at the first pitch, and that's out number one. Speaking of defense, the A's have made wholesale changes. Gross moves over to left. He, Hermita comes in the game. He's in right. No, Ellis comes in at second. Barton comes in at first. Pierre. So with one out, it's the top of the order for the White Sox. Juan Pierre. First pitch strike from Botzer. Brad Ziegler is throwing in the A's bullpen. A little flare to left, and that's going to get down for a hit. Juan Pierre has been on base three times. A couple of hits and hit by a pitch. Gross is playing very shallow and on the curveball. Number 10. Just served out the left field. A flare. Dave Gross played very well, not trying to make the spectacular play and then keep the double play in order. 
So here's Alexi Ramirez, who is 0 for 3. Ramirez in his last at bat in the sixth inning was robbed of a hit. He had a line drive, and he Ramirez made a nice play. Lefty and a righty for the White Sox. Thornton and puts. This series is two for ten. Pierre has one stolen base in the series. That was the last night's game. Down by two here in the eighth. You're not running, and the pitch is lined. Left center field, actually a little flare that goes over the head of Pennington and drops into left center field. And Juan Pierre easily makes it to third. First and third, and one out here in the eighth. And now the heart of this White Sox order is coming up. And it's going to be Brad Ziegler. Tough for Luke Bonser because he's made good pitches. He's got runners at first and third, and two very soft hits. So when it's time for a change, think speedy oil change and tune up your oil change, tune up and smog expert. Ziegler coming in to face Rios. a $150 per seat deposit on a 2011 ticket plan. You receive an authentic A's jersey of the player of your choice. There are a limited number of jerseys available for this promotion. Get more information online, oaklandathletics.com, or call 510-638-GO-A's. So a tense moment here with Rio stepping in. First and third, one out, A's leading 3-1. to one. First pitch from Brad Ziegler to Alex Rios is outside. Bazi Pian would put Ramirez in steel mode and uh, try to possibly stay out of a double play. A's are looking for that one ground ball to get to. And they're going to have the runner picked off at first. And now Ramirez going back to first, still in the rundown. Ziegler drops the ball. The runner's coming to the plate, and the throw is not in time. Mm, mm, mm. And boy, it looked like he got him with the head first slide. Looked like he tagged him. 
Really did not think it was going to be that close of a play at the plate when Zing dropped the ball. But in hindsight, probably would have been better to take the out at first, which was a sure out. And then the bases are clear. Yeah, right? and let Pierre score. But the fake to third got him, but too many throws here. Just a few too many throws. And then when Zig dropped the ball, Pierre is trying to score. Well, that's that's a bang bang. The only thing, maybe tagged him on the forearm. Did the hand get the plate plate first? Yeah. Oh, Tremont, let's look. see. Get out of the way. If you got him right there, he's out. Just a question of whether he tagged him because his hand had not gotten to the bag or the plate. And Ramirez is safe at first, but just like that, it's going to be a double play. So Alex Rios bounces into the double play for the second time in the game. White Sox get a run. It's three to two. Our game summary brought to you by McDonald's. Two eight and one for the White Sox. Three five and zero oh for the Athletics. It was a one nothing game after five, and each team with a couple of solo runs. Pennington, Suzuki, and Cust against Matt Thornton. And it's time for change. Think speedy oil change in tune-up. Your oil change tune-up and smog experts. Very hard thrower. He was an all star this year. Pennington is 0 for 2. He was hit by a pitch and ended up scoring a run after being hit by a pitch. And that was a big part of this game. Seven good innings for Edward Jackson, but he's on the hook right now for the loss. Three and one to Pennington. And now full count. Foul ball. Pennington hanging in there against the lefty Thornton. Now 
on the ground to the shortstop Ramirez. Throws quickly, throws wide, but Canerco is able to tag Pennington. It's kind of a lob throw by Ramirez, and it almost cost him. Very good play this time by Canerco. Last inning could not handle the bad throw by Littlebridge, but that is not a good throw. And if there's ever a time to slide at first base, this would have been the time as Canerco had to jump. Pennington tried to get under him, but Canerco was able to tag him. Roberto Alomar, one of the best at going into the slide to avoid a tag like that. Always bring him up because he was one guy who should never want to have a guy slide in the first base because it slows you down, but in that case, or this type of play, you, you'd like to see it. On one to Suzuki, who is a single and a walk and a fly ball to center field today. In the top of the ninth inning, the White Sox will have Canerco, Quinton, and Flowers as their three scheduled hitters. And there's nobody throwing in the A's bullpen. Yeah, Zeke is going to be the guy. Of course, we know Breslow, and of course, we have three tough right handers. Brad Zigner is the kind of the reason he came in the game. Of course, he has had the experience, but I try to keep the ball on the ground. Get a couple of guys on. The one thing you don't know is a home run. And Zig keeping the ball on the ground. Got to work on that fake the third throw to first to hang on to the ball in the rundown. It worked sort of. <laughs> the first part worked. Bouncer over the mound. Lillibridge on the move makes a nice play. And if he's scoring at home, Pierre scored on a stolen base. He was given a steal. And I guess if you consider it the rundown on a caught stealing by the runner first and rundown ensued and he scored. At least that's a scoring decision. Well, that's how the guy leads the league in steals, right? <laughs> gift, Christmas gift on yeah. September the 22nd. Ortiz and Watt Pierre. Well, Fred Anderson did a very good job keeping him close today with the very quick moves. Slide step. Oh, and two to cuss. Two is one for three. See Gabe Gross face Thorn. He had a walk off home run for the Tampa Bay Rays at home. He, the Tampa Bay place went crazy. The big picture up in the press area of Gabe hitting a walk off against this hard throwing left. Let's hope he doesn't have to try to do no, it today. We don't want to see, see Gabe Gross in the batter box anymore. Three twos. We go to the ninth. Ladies and
game, and it goes to the big man. Chris Carter gives the A's a one to nothing lead, and it is a special home run, his first major league home run. He was three for 37, those three hits, three singles. And Chris Carter dropped the head of the heavy bat on a good fastball from Edwin Jackson, and the result is one to hit remember for a long time. So ninth inning, A's hanging on to that one run lead, three to two, and Ziegler will try to save it. Conurco, Quinton, and then Flowers. There's the slider, and they said Conurco went around. He does not agree. Uh, you make the call in Ultra Mo. This is it's a home plate umpire's call. His team made the call, and why they do it, I don't know. That was too close to call. Waves at that slider, not even close, and Conurco strikes out, and that is out number one. Well, no chance. This left Ziegler's hand as a ball. Well, Conurco, well, that's man. where you want to stay. If you have a right-handed power hitter, keep the ball away from him. Don't give him a chance. So here's Carlos Quinton. First pitch to Quinton is low. 25 home runs, so be careful with this guy. And there's a strike on the outside corner. Jay Brzezinski has come out into the on deck circle. Now three and one. Marie, you mentioned it the other day, the White Sox have not been good here at the Coliseum in that West Coast. Stretch for them has always been a tough trip. Seems like Anaheim here, Seattle, we just have not been able to put it together. A one out walk to Quinton, so the tying run is aboard. Diaz is going to be the pinch runner for Quinton. Number 30, Alejandro Diaz. So Alejandro Diaz, the pinch runner. AJ Brzezinski, the pinch hitter. Number 12, AJ Brzezinski, heading for Flowers. As we've mentioned uh, throughout this series and throughout the times play, the White Sox Brzezinski will put the ball in play more times than not. Just in this case against Ziegler, just hope it's on the ground. If they do that, it's a good chance to end the game with a double play. First pitch down and away to Brzezinski. Mark Katze has come out into the on deck circle. That's Viciedo's spot. And the numbers will tell you exactly why Zegin is doing this. Lefties hitting 315 against Sigler. Righties 205. Mark Tian, also a left handed hitter. Still in that White Sox dugout. The great Dennis Eckersley, Hall of Famer. He'd come in. Tom Keller with the Twins. Any left hander he had, bring him out of the stands to put him. He has a runs and the pitches bounce to Barton. Big hop. Steps on the bag and that's out number two. He has a at second base. Now probably a straight steal. It just happened to be a pitch that Perzinski swung and hit the slow roller. Young is going to visit with his pitcher, and the only play for Derek Barton was to get the runner at first. So the meeting on the mound with the A's one out away from the sweep of the White Sox. Mark Kotze will be the pinch hitter. Number seven. 
Mark Matze. Amorel called back, and Mark Tehan, yep. which you mentioned, is going to be coming up. And former A, he's outfield. Very good center fielder, Mark Katze. So the first pitch to Katze is way outside. Is the inside corner. So the count even at one and one. Inside is a target. Started inside, bring it back over the inside corner. Red Ziegler did it perfect. In the dirt, good blocked by Kurt Suzuki. That is the tying run. Alejandro Diaz of the pinch runner. A's post game live coming up immediately following the conclusion of our ball game. Way outside again, three and one. Again, Mark Tehan in the on deck circle. He is a left handed hitter. Three one pitches sliced foul. So now it's come down to this. The count is full. And the crowd will get up on its feet. Unfortunately, the A's at one time had three lefties in the bullpen. Jared Blevins a little banged up. And of course, never say no Breslow for four or five days. So it's up to it. 3-2 pitch is line to right, get down, no, it's a base hit. And this ball game is tied. Going to try to do the same thing for strike one to get the strikeout, the fastball inside. And Mark Kotze, smart enough hitter, that he got it. Went down and got it, and just no chance for Hermida to be able to get to the ball to make the play. So the veteran Katze and the one out walk to the right hander, Quinn. Now batting number 23, Katze comes through. I was yelling at Jeremy Hermida to get down and dive for it. So we're tied at three. Here's Tehan. The first pitch, she's down and away. So Katze ties it with two outs here in the ninth. Just back in town. Very close. Beckham just in the game to pinch run. It's a quick tag by Derek Barton. Thought he'd gotten it. One over to TN is outside. Two and This one's drilled the left center field. On the run is Gabe Girl still on the run. He's not going to get it. It's off the wall. Here comes Beckham rounding third, and he will score. The White Sox take a four to three lead.
Well, Ozzy Gann pulled up every left hander he could get. Pretty good pitch by Ziegler down and away, but the fact that it's 2 0. And Tian looking for the fastball, and then Gabe Gross, uh, an overthrow of the cutoff man, gave no chance with any relay to try to get Beckham scoring from first. So the left handed hitter yeah. statistic has right. really shown up here in the ninth inning. Well, and really, the walk to Quentin. Yeah. He was the right hander, and that would have been two outs if you could have gotten him. And didn't happen, and two outs, two pinch hit hits. Here's Lillibridge. Lillibridge, big bouncer toward Pennington on the run, and they get Lillibridge on a very close play. At first base, but damage done as the White Sox score twice in the top of the ninth to take a four to three lead. A bottom of the ninth. Unfortunately, there is. White Sox score two, and they do it with two outs in the top of the ninth inning to grab the 4 3 lead. So the A's got one more shot here, and they will have to do it against Matt Foy. Diazza stays in the game in right field, and Brzezinski stays in the game as the catcher. Omar Vizquel in there, so we'll. Quick run through of that defense. There's Diaz in right. Vizquel at third. Brzezinski now behind the plate. Thornton still on the mound, and we have a pinch hitter for Gabe Gross. It's Matt Carson. So the first pitch to Carson. Is popped up. Lillibridge shading his eyes, and he's got it. Wow. So Carson goes after the first pitch and pops out. And Josh Donaldson's got a pitch hit for Elon Muro. Trying to get as many. Right hander is to face the hard throwing lefty. Number 29, Josh Donaldson. Donaldson has good power. You'd like to see maybe Thornton just make a mistake with that fastball. I think Bob Garrett like to see Thornton out of the out of the game, but as again staying with his hard throwing, he did a good fastball that he has. Doesn't matter lefty or righty. A strike to Donaldson. Derek Barton is in the cleanups. They're in the on deck circle. So a quick 0 2 to Donaldson. Foul tip. And 
just like that Donaldson is down on strikes so two quick outs here in the bottom of the ninth inning. So Barton will try to get aboard. If Barton can get on Mark Ellis will hit. Barton came in the game for defense in the top of the ninth inning. You see Thornton. That's a very easy delivery, but he throws very hard. He's a big guy. And he is consistently at 95, 96 miles an hour. That one at 97. Two to Barton. Fastball runs high. Barton gets a piece of that one, fouls it straight back. Just below us to our left. Just outside, not by much. As Thornton thought he had strike three. But Todd Tishner says it was outside. Fortunately, Derek Barton has a good eye, and he's took that one for a ball. 2 2 pick. Base hit left field. Pierre cuts it off, and Derek Barton a big turn, and now he will scramble back to first as Ramirez loses control of the ball. Nothing Barton could do, but the ace still alive here in the bottom of the ninth. Barton with a two out hit. And as again, maybe that will bring in the right hander instead of having Thornton play. And that's what he's going to do, and he's not going to face Mark Ellis. Eric Barton. If he had known, of course, yeah, doesn't have a strong arm, got the ball back in quickly, and that was the key to hold Barton at first. J.J. Puts coming in, the big right-hander. When it's time for change, think speedy oil change in tune-up. Your oil change tune-up and smog experts. Well, that is Derek Barton. He's the tying run at first base. Two outs. J.J. puts the big, powerful right-hander facing Mark Ellis. First pitch is low. We've seen Mark Ellis over the years with a lot of big hits for the A's. Good year for J.J. puts out of that White Sox bullpen.
Big bouncer in the hole and in the left field of base hit. Barton stops at second. Ellis gets the hit. And here comes Jeremy Hermida with a chance to be a hero. Well, puts a good low fastball and Mark Ellis just beat at the ground. Or you think about Derek Barton, a two strike hitting going opposite field and started to go to second base, didn't, and, whew. and so who's going to pinch hit for Hermita? All right, we got a pitching change, and we'll be back. Steve Tollison is he today's hero maybe and he's gonna face Chris Sale interesting story here Ray Chris Sale was number one draft choice for the White Sox this year yeah it might be in a rotation <laughs> next year this year right now in the bullpen and got a great arm yep. Let's see how good it is so Sale the lefty to face the pinch hitter Tollison Barton is at second. He's the tying run. Ellis at first. He's the winning run. Sales first pitch. Okay, he throws hard. Yeah, 96. 96. Tollison knew it too, and it's pretty good swing. Pinch hitter. He swing. Get loose. Let it go. Jerry Blevins physique. Yeah. No one won. That one way outside. Brzezinski reaches for it. Well, the White Sox are giving the A's both bases. If they want to double steal, they could walk. They could just walk to third and, and second. And right, you know what? Omar Vizquel may not leave his position. No, they won't. Off they're they're going to hold the position. I mean, they're not going to hold the gas close. There's a fastball right there. Strike two call. 95 miles an hour. And a wild finish here to this ball game. One and two. Sale is ready. The pitch. Got him swinging. Went with an off-speed pitch. Tollison strikes out. And that's how the ball game ends. Well, Ray, we've said it before. Some losses are tougher to take than others. Yeah. This one hurts. Yes, it does. But a banged up bullpen, and it, it showed today, unfortunately. Well, the A's were one out away from sweeping the White Sox, but the White Sox went to the bench, and the pinch hitters came through. So the White Sox with two in the top of the ninth. 4-3 is your final. Don't go away. Ace Post Game Live with Dave Benz and Shooting